Everyone is looking for answers. Answers to both the common and the complicated matters of life. Thankfully, the real answers to all of life's questions are found in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the key that unlocks these answers, providing real solutions for this life and the life to come. As you join us today, you'll discover real answers to life's most pressing questions. And you, along with us, can rejoice in the Lord. Take your Bible, if you would, and join me today in the book of Philippians, chapter number two. Philippians, chapter number two. In just a moment, we'll be down at verse number 25. And then today, we'll finish out this second chapter in this book that presents to us what we've referred to as unimaginable joy. Now, quite honestly, we're going to look at something today that has the potential to not only interrupt, but actually Um, do some great interference to the joy that is unimaginable because of some of the challenges and difficulties and even the unexpected events that take place through the course of life. Uh, Years ago, I used to help with our candy sale that was at our academy with with the elementary kids and high school kids. And we did something as a promotional for those who, who were like the top people who sold the most candy and we called it leap for dollars and I'm telling you it was a lot of fun I put on like my my uh, you know game show host jacket and um, we had kids come up and what we did is we we lined an area with dollars and there was a starting point and they just had to leap for dollars and so however far they went we just grabbed all of those dollars that they just cleared and then scattered through the dollars there were always some envelopes and so whatever was in the envelope you know they could claim as their own now we would count all of the dollars and so maybe they had i don't know 12 or 15 dollars and three envelopes and all of it was theirs but they didn't know what was in the envelope yet And so you know what happens. Then the game show host always pulls from his pocket, you know, another envelope. And he says, "Um, okay, you can keep everything that you have or you can trade it all for this envelope right here. Now, there could be any number of, uh, you know, dollars in this envelope. And they'd say, can I feel it? No, 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 you can't feel it. So... Do you want to trade or do you want to keep? And then, of course, whoever's in the room, all of these these school kids, they just start to yell. And some of them are going to yell, trade, trade. And some of the more, no, listen, a dollar in the hand, you know, don't trade. And so sometimes they would trade. And quite honestly, sometimes they got more than what they had in their hand. But exactly, sometimes... It was a crying offense. <laughs> and they, they went away with far less than they could have had. It's risky business. I suppose that we think the Christian life is supposed to be done in such a way that, that if I risk it all, clearly I'm going to end up the better for the risk. That if I say, God, you can have my future, it's going to wind up better for me, right, in this life. Now, we know that, that no man who has offered something here will sacrifice it in the life to come. But many times we try to reorder God's economy and say, Lord, if I risk it all in this life, now you're going to guarantee that it's going to come out okay, right? I'm actually going to do better if I come open-handed to you. And I say, okay, Lord, you just take it all. Now, whatever I give, it's going to be multiplied in this life many times over, right? And interestingly enough, that's not always the way in God's economy that it works out. In this life, not everybody gets a a trophy or, or for that matter, a participation award. Not everybody is going to have the future that they dreamed of. Not everybody's going to have the conclusion, the job, the retirement, the spouse, the life that they had anticipated here. Not everyone is going to have the life they want there. 
It's risky business. I started to think about the 56 men who on July 4th, 1776, put their name on a document titled the Declaration of Independence. And they recognized something through the course of that document. And to something bigger than themselves, they were actually willing to risk it all. Today, we're going to look at another in Scripture. He's not mentioned all throughout Scripture, but he's mentioned in the book of Philippians. And he's a guy who is willing to risk it all. Your Bibles are open right now to Philippians chapter 2. Let's begin reading in verse number 25. You follow along as I read. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed, he was sick nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I send him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation because, please don't miss this, because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. Now, before we get into this message, let's take a look at, a brief look at the the person. Who is this guy that we're about to see unfold before us in in these words in Scripture? Well, his name is Epaphroditus. So if we just pause and think for a moment, if you know anything about Greek culture or history during Bible times, this name has some ring of familiarity to you. The, The Greek goddess Aphrodite, was one who was a goddess of, and and because this name's listed here, I'm gonna be a little bit more direct. She's the goddess of love. We might actually insert the goddess of lust. There was some sensuality connected to her. She's also, and I find this intriguing, she's also known as a goddess of not only love, but also of luck or good fortune. And so this one that was sent from the church at Philippi to minister to the Apostle Paul and to to be a messenger on their behalf, his name, Epaphroditus, Aphrodite. So now he is named after this, um, this Greek goddess and he has come with something that is far bigger than himself. Now, remember, he's coming to... He's coming from Philippi to Rome. He's going to take care of the Apostle Paul. And by the way, this is interesting as well. He's coming to take care of the Apostle Paul because Paul is a prisoner, but he doesn't have to be in prison. He does have to be chained to a Roman guard 24-7. And that's interesting as well. I mean, Rome probably thought, yeah, we're we're going to let him have a little freedom, but we're going to chain him to somebody 24-7, Paul's like, wow. And they would rotate them on shifts. And Paul's just thinking, hey, listen, I'm going to share the gospel and they can't get away from me. I think he thought it was the other way around. And so they're they're there. He is on house arrest. And the church at Philippi said, we're going to help you with your responsibilities. So Epaphroditus took the money and he became something far more than a financial delivery boy. He became, in a sense, connected to the Apostle Paul as his right-hand man. He ministered very deeply to an apostle in need. Let's begin by looking at what we see here in Scripture as a helpful description. A helpful description. Look again at verse number 25 and look at what Paul connects to something for him. He says, he is my this. And then he says, he is your church at Philippi. He is this to you. So look again, verse number 25. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. 
The first thing we see here that is listed in this passage are his titles, his titles. And Paul does make this very personal. He's really saying he's my brother. He's my companion in labor. He is my fellow soldier. And then he says, he is your messenger and he is your minister, the one who came and ministered because you're not able to actually be here and minister. So notice some of the the descriptors that he uses. He starts out with my brother. I believe he began as a brother in the faith. And that is a, a, by the way, a powerful term, brother, sister. So he begins as a brother in the faith, but I I think he moved to something even more more deeply associated with the apostle Paul than just a a brother in the faith. I think he became like a, a brother indeed. Someone that the apostle looks at now and he says, listen, he is more than just a a part of this family. It's like he is a part of me, my own family. I believe he lived honorably to those who were without the church, but he lived as family to those that were within the church. And by the way, we, we usually, we appropriately give some family room to those that we don't always provide for others outside the family. In other words, the church should act like brothers and sisters in Christ. We provide resources for family more freely. We speak with them more openly. We go to greater lengths for them more willingly and plainly put, we love them more deeply than we do those outside of the family. And how appropriate this is within the family of God. The Bible says it this way in Galatians chapter six, verse 10, the Bible says, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, but especially unto them who are of the household of faith. He says, hey, listen, be kind, be good, be gracious to everybody. But let me add a little, and especially, if they're part of the family of God, then you should take special, special care to show some loving grace, some simple kindness, some gentle courtesy to those who are a part of the household of faith. How we need to maintain a spirit of love and of kindness and of doing good to others, especially those who are of the household of faith. But he goes on, he says, okay, first of all, he's my brother. And then he goes on and he says this, he says, he's my companion in labor. Now he doesn't use the expression elsewhere, this may be fine and fitting, my fellow laborer. Now that could be somebody that you're just in a sense, standing shoulder to shoulder with or standing in the same spirit of, and hey, we're all part of this, we're, we're fellow laborers. But, but Paul said, there's something that's more special about Epaphroditus. He is my companion in labor. He's not the same kind of companion as Apollos or Peter or even Silas for that matter. He was the kind of companion that felt completely comfortable observing, watching, waiting to see how he could be of some service to the apostle Paul. He'd just look and he'd find some little detail that he could attend to. And then immediately he would attend to it. Maybe no one ever saw that that detail was cared for other than Epaphroditus and Almighty God. But Epaphroditus was not this, I've got to be out front. He was the guy who said, listen, I'm not the out front guy. I'm just a guy who wants to find a way to serve And I'm confident that God's going to provide me an opportunity to do it. I believe he would anticipate Paul's need and then find a way to fill the need. And notice how he went far beyond simply filling the need of the great apostle. The Bible says in Philippians 2.25 at the end, he said he was, you know, your messenger, but he was the one that ministered to my wants. This guy, Epaphroditus, was a companion to the Apostle Paul in labor. And as they labored together, Epaphroditus, he becomes something more than just a fellow or common laborer. As is often the case, as they served together, they forged a friendship that ran very deep. Some of the deepest, most rewarding friendships will be birthed in the trenches of serving while the military is provided for a lot of those friendships that are deep and endure the test of time, 
so also are the friendships that are forged in the fields of God's service. Those who serve side by side for his kingdom find that they will not only labor together, they also laugh together. They will not only groan under the load of work, but will also grow under the light of that work. They share reaping in the harvest fields, even as they many times share recreation in some happy fields. What better place to see these lifetime friendships materialize than in the service of the king? We we would all do well to remember that serving together for a purpose and a cause bigger than ourselves is one of the best ways to forge true and meaningful and lasting friendships. It is why I believe church is one of those most special of places where a body, a family comes together and now we start to serve with one another. You'll form lifetime friendships in the service of the king as a member of his body. C.S. Lewis in his book, Four Loves, detailed it in in a pretty interesting or insightful way. C.S. Lewis said in in that book, he said, we picture lovers face to face, and that's appropriately so. He's not disparaging that in the least. He's just saying very simply, we picture lovers standing face to face. Now, if, if Julie were here, now she wouldn't because she'd be deeply embarrassed, but if Julie was up here right now, in fact, if I asked her to join me right now, and I won't because I like being married, okay, but... But if I asked Julie to stand here with me, if there's nobody here in the room, it wouldn't be awkward for us to stand hand to hand, face to face. Wouldn't be awkward at all. Because I find her beautiful. I I love her on so many different levels. So to stand here face to face and just look at Julie, I I like that thought. Okay, but Dr. Zach is here on the platform, okay. (laughs) Okay, now, if I'm standing with Dr. Zach, as I look into his face, I do not find it beautiful, okay? (laughs) But here's what C.S. Lewis said. He said, we picture lovers face to face, but friends side by side, absorbed in some common cause. There is a place for face to face. God provided for that. He, he established it in marriage. But there is also, what the Apostle Paul details here, there is also a place for side by side that it doesn't become about each other, it becomes about something bigger than the other. And that is the God that we serve. And the Apostle Paul looks at Epaphroditus and he says, listen, This guy is not just my brother. He's my companion in labor. And then he goes on and he says, he's my fellow soldier. Isn't it wonderful that God enlists a variety of people to advance his work? I mean, hey, we're fellow soldiers. How different is the apostle Paul from a guy named after a Greek goddess? Uh, Paul, his, his, uh, his Hebrew name, Saul. It means desired. Saul is a Pharisee of the Pharisee. He's trained at the feet of Gamaliel. He's a guy that God has gifted and empowered and used in in ways that we, we know none his equal. And then you have Timothy. Timothy's mentioned just prior to Epaphroditus. Timothy is is a younger man, but oh, he has this pastor's heart. We see him continually being mentored at the feet of the apostle Paul. Paul looks at him not just as a brother, Paul looks at Timothy as a son. Timothy is from a mixed race. He, He has a Jew for a mother, he has a Gentile for a father. So he's different. And then you have Epaphroditus. He's named after a Greek goddess. Isn't it wonderful that God can take the the differences that make us so unique and bring it together and we can be fellow soldiers for a cause bigger than you and I? I mean, battles have been fought and won when people come together of very different backgrounds. But they say there is something bigger than us and they are engaged in that which is before them. They become fellow soldiers. And then he changes direction just a bit. And he says, now, he's also your messenger. 
your messenger. The, the Greek word there that, that we translate as messenger would be directly transliterated when Paul would say something like, I am an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the same Greek word that's used. He's your messenger. Some commentators have called Epaphroditus the, the people's apostle. Okay. He, he was not filling the office of apostle like the apostle Paul, the apostle Peter, the apostle John, but he's filling a role for a church as, hey, listen, you've got a message to deliver. And so he becomes their, their messenger. And then he also becomes their minister. Listen, we can't be there and do that right now. Paul says, because he, he supplied because of your lack of service. He doesn't, he's not disparaging their service. He's not saying, hey, you didn't do something and so Epaphroditus. And he says, no, 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 you couldn't be here and do this, but you did send someone who could supply what you can't supply. And so now he's also not just this one who says, hey, I, I'm the, uh, the people's apostle. He's also the people's messenger. God uniquely uses each and every one of us for jobs that we're fit and suited to do. And my, how Epaphroditus was suited to the work that God had him to do. Well, you know, when we're looking through this, that, that's just a helpful description. But let's just quickly look at two additional things. Secondly, heavy distress. We, we see a helpful description. We know something about this man just from the way that Paul very quickly describes him. But notice now this, this heavy distress. Look down at verse number 26. Here the Bible says, for he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. Isn't it insightful that his personal sadness, Epaphroditus is, is heavy with sadness, but his personal sadness didn't come from his own sickness, rather from the sorrow that he saw his sickness was causing others. There was a beautiful selflessness connected to his suffering. And make no mistake, his suffering was deep. In fact, the only other time that this expression is used, when it, when it says he was full of heaviness, the only other time that expression is used in all of Scripture is used the same way in two of the Gospels. And it's used, do you remember when Jesus went to the garden and the suffering that he experienced in the garden? The Bible says, and Jesus began to be sorrowful and very heavy. There it is. That now Epaphroditus feels some weight because this heaviness, because my sickness is causing others sorrow. This is a selfless suffering. If you ask Epaphroditus, how are you doing? His heaviness is not like, oh, I feel so bad. His heaviness comes because I know what my suffering is causing others. What a place for the suffering servant and then look at how serious this was for indeed, verse number 27, for indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him and not him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Have you ever been, how many of you have ever had this? Many of you have. How many of you have ever been playing in the water at the beach and you get smashed by a wave and it just kind of takes you off your feet? It caught you by surprise. Have you ever, how many of you have ever had that happen before? Okay, so most of you, how many of you have ever had the second one really catch you by surprise? Like you're out there, you're playing, oh boy, it just catches you and it kind of tumbles you. And then you're sputtering and you come up for breath and all of a sudden, oh, another one hits you. The Bible uses that expression in a positive way when, when in the book of John, the apostle John says, and grace for grace. He says grace that follows grace. It's like a wave of grace followed by a wave of grace. But here the apostle Paul uses the illustration in a way that's more challenging. He says, God, if you, if you took him out of my life, I would have a wave of sorrow that would be followed by a wave of sorrow. And this is in a book that's dealing with unimaginable joy. I think it speaks to the humanity of the Apostle Paul. He, he understands there are people, Lord, you know, I, I suppose, Lord, that if you took Epaphroditus, I'd have wave upon wave of sorrow, and then I would also have grace that follows grace. Wave upon wave of grace. 
Paul understood that. Paul's trusting the Lord. But just the human side of the apostle Paul said, Lord, if, if he was removed from me, I should have sorrow upon sorrow. The sickness is so severe that Paul wanted to know, wanted the church to know that it almost took the life of Epaphroditus. And the word sick here, it's an interesting word. He says, and he was sick, okay? He was, there, he was nigh unto death. The word's not only used in a, in a way that communicates our, our physical health. Listen to how else that word's used in scripture. Romans 5, 6. For when we were yet sick, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's the same word and I find it really insightful. Because you know, we're born into this world sick. We're born into this world without strength. And so Christ died for the ungodly. He did what you and I can't do. He provided a means by which we can be made righteous. The thing that my sickness, the thing that my sin caused was my inability to do anything about it. I don't have to fix myself up to come to Christ. I just have to come to Christ sick and unable and without strength. And the one who has the strength that I need says, let me do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And Christ died for the sick, for those without strength. Well, that was the position physically of Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus had no strength and, and, and the apostle Paul recognizes it. Well, Paul said, I'm gonna send him back to you. I'm gonna send him back because my sorrow will be lessened because I know you'll be okay, because you need to see Epaphroditus. Even Paul here is making his own benefit, his own de desires subservient to the desires of the church at Philippi. But look at this last thing. The last thing that we see is not just this helpful description or the heavy distress, but now a hard decision. It's really what's left for us today. I wanna just highlight this important phrase that is connected to Epaphroditus. Your Bibles are still open to Philippians chapter two. Look at verse number 30. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life. That's the expression. To supply your lack of service toward me. The words not regarding his life are translated from a Greek word that means to throw it aside. He took something that was, in a sense, the most important commodity that we have, and that is the ability to take another breath. He said, I have taken my life and I have set it aside because there is something of greater value. It is the work of Christ. It speaks of hazarding one's life, one's welfare, one's benefit, exposing themselves to danger with total disregard for their own welfare, he continually put his life on the line for the work of Christ. Sometimes we use the expression, well, hey, listen, if you do that, it's risky business. There's all kinds of fine print whenever a person may invest because there's no guarantee. Sometimes we use the expression, well, it's quite a gamble. But we don't want to connect that to the work of the Lord. We want to think that if I do the work of the Lord, there's no gamble involved in this life. God, you're, you're going to have everything work out. And Epaphroditus said, no, 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 no. I'm actually going to risk it all. I'm going to put my life in the hands of the one who can care for my life far better than can I. Did you ever watch a weekly program where it appeared that the hero had died. You know, I mean, you watch the Lone Ranger and it's like, oh, the Lone Ranger just, I mean, they, they, they messed with your head a little bit and, and it looks like the Lone Ranger just died. Some of you out there are saying, I've never heard of the Lone Ranger. Well, well he's a cowboy guy. Okay. And then you gotta wait for a week to get back to, you know, did he, did he make it? I mean, come on, the show is called The Lone Ranger, okay? It's not some lone stranger that you're gonna meet every new guy every week, it's the Lone Ranger. So you know he's coming back. And sometimes I think we feel like, well, Christianity is kind of like that. It might appear risky, but it's always gonna be, the hero's always gonna make it, but not always. 
Sometimes a hero doesn't make it. In, in New Testament times, right after the, the writing, a group of Christians banded together in, a, in an association that they called the parabolani. It, it came from the Greek word that's used here when, when he just, in a sense, didn't regard his life. The word actually came to mean gamble. And this group, the, the parabolani, they, they were literally, in a sense, what would be called the gamblers. Taking Epaphroditus as their model, they visited prisoners, they ministered to the sick, especially those with dangerous communicable diseases whom nobody else would help. They boldly proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever they went. In the year AD 252, the city of Carthage on the Mediterranean coast of North Africa, it, it experienced an incredible plague and people died. And, and people were so fearful to do anything about it that they literally stacked people's bodies. They were just lining the streets and nobody would touch them except for the Parabolani. They're the ones who went in and said, we will do what needs to be done because there's a purpose, a cause that is bigger than our we. Their spiritual influence continues on to those who were formerly unbelieving and hostile to the cause of Christ. They, like Epaphroditus, hazarded their lives for the sake of the gospel. Okay, so let's just speculate. And it is speculation. Paul died and Epaphroditus died. So do you think that more people missed Paul than they did Epaphroditus? And here's my honest conclusion. I'm not trying to play a game. I think yes. I think Paul had greater exposure. More people knew of him. His influence was probably to a greater degree. But here's what I also think. I don't think that he was missed more deeply than Epaphroditus. I think that those who knew Epaphroditus would have missed him like they missed the Apostle Paul. That's a good miss. It hurts when they're gone, but there was something bigger than their life that they were living for. So as we conclude, the question for all of us is this. To what end are we living? May we risk it all, and may we live to be missed. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord.